Thanks for joining us tonight at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo. Lazaritasville, they call this place. It's the first of five programs all week long here where we're looking at the future of schools and learning. If you can't be with us in person here tonight, you can still be part of tonight's discussion. We are streaming this at a special website, tvo.org slash learning2030. Our producers are hosting live chats as well on that site, as well as our regular website, theagenda.tvo.org. You can also join in via Twitter. Use the hashtag learning2030 or hashtag EQX for Equinox Summit, EQX13, and join the conversation. Now, in the past, some of the students that we're going to be talking about tonight might have been called unmotivated or maybe lazy, students who just didn't try very hard, their hearts weren't in it. It wasn't about learning, it was putting your time in, and it was getting the heck out of school as quickly as you could. However, for some, educators now no longer speak of lazy and unmotivated students. They talk about a term disengaged. And tonight, we're going to focus on this question. Is engaging the disengaged at the heart of schools making their way into the 21st century. And we have five guests who have come from near and far to help us answer that tonight. They are John Kershaw. He is the co-founder of 21st Century Learning Associates. He's a former deputy minister in New Brunswick's Department of Education. Graham Brown Martin. He is the founder of Education Design Labs. He comes to us from London, UK. Kaisa Kuopala. She is a PhD student in the Department of Teacher Education from the University of Helsinki. Susan Opok is the managing director of a group called Promoting Equality in African Schools. She comes to us tonight from Uganda. And Zainab Ramahi, she is co-president of Knowledge Integration Student Society at the University of Waterloo. And would you welcome our guests to the Perimeter Institute this evening, thank you. Thank you all. We're very grateful you could make some time for our broadcast tonight. We're going out, of course, not just in the province of Ontario, but also online all around the world, no doubt to your home countries as well. Just to set the tone for our discussion tonight, we're going to play a short video clip and then we'll come back and chat, okay? So, Sheldon, roll tape, please. The single most important thing we can do is to make sure we've got a world-class education system for everybody. That is a prerequisite for prosperity. It is an obligation that we have for the next generation. I looked at the current educational system, I said, what's wrong with it? And the biggest problem that I found was it didn't know how to motivate kids. Every person alive, it's in our DNA to be motivated. I think the current model, and I'm not picking out any players, the current model is just really good at squashing that motivation. John Kershaw, let's get it started tonight. Good students have always been with us, they've always been engaged. Not so good students have always been with us and have not been too engaged. Has disengagement among students not always been with us? What's new about this? I think it's fair to say that uh, we've always had some students that are more engaged than others. I think we have to also take a look, first of all, of recognizing that there's uh, a different era that we're in, in terms of the knowledge and digital era. Um, I think, though, that if we're talking about learners, I think a lot of learners are more engaged in their own learning than ever before. What they are disengaging from is the public education system uh, that isn't meeting their needs. So in other words, I think they are much more active in identifying what they want and what they think they need to be successful and the public education system isn't giving them what they need. So it's not a question of being bored or disinterested in life or not wanting to learn. We're just not providing the system that's adequate to that task, is that and, it? And, and I think that's been true all along, but I think what's happening is it's escalating now. Uh, students are much more, uh, they have access to information far more than they ever had before, so they can uh, gain knowledge. Uh, they're more connected to their peers, so they can, um, connect on issues, they're connected globally in terms of what's going on politically, environmentally, and so they're, they're just a much more knowledgeable group than ever before. And so they're very much more distinguishing what it is they feel they want and what they need. And the, they've evolved, and the public education system, which is rooted in 19th and 20, uh, 20th century thinking and, uh, and needs, hasn't evolved 
along with them. Can I do a quick pick up on that? Because mm -hmm. we hear that all the time now. Mm -hmm. We have a system today that was designed in the 19th and 20th centuries, and we're in the 21st century. Can you explain why that's still the case? Uh, there's a lot of, anybody that's been involved with public education knows that it's a very, very difficult uh, creature. Uh, it's not designed to be innovative. And the rest of the world is moving. It's innovation driven now. The, the market is innovation driven. Society is looking at innovative ways to, uh, for governance. Uh, we're looking at um, innovative ways to address some very complex global issues. Um, meanwhile, the public education system is very rooted in uh, very traditional approaches to learning in most cases where the teacher is the dispenser of knowledge and if the uh, learner regurgitates that information, they get a good mark. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's true everywhere. We're having pockets of innovation, but it's not systemic. It's, um, we've got an industrial age model uh, in many parts of the uh, world, including Canada. We're seeing some great innovative approaches. Well, in uh, some respects, in some, an, a, an mm. agrarian system too. We still give kids the summer off so they can go till the fields. Absolutely. Which hasn't and, been and, that way really for 100 which is years. A, which is a great example to answer your question about why uh, we haven't changed. If you go and you start talking about to, to the um, agricultural community about the need to evolve to, a, to a, a different kind of model, and you're saying that you're not going to be releasing those kids to work in the fields anymore, you get great resistance from some, from some groups. But that's 2% of our economy now. It's 2% of our economy, but also that's representative that there's a lot of stakeholders in education, mm. all with a vested interest and often unwilling to listen to the reasons for change. Well, look, let's look at some of these numbers here, because this may echo what we've just been talking about. There's a group called the Canadian Education Association, and we've had their representatives mm -hmm. on previous programs. And they talk about student disengagement, and some of these numbers are not terrific. They measure it in three ways, social, institutional, and intellectual. About five years ago, they discovered that 30% of students were disengaged socially, 30% had spotty attendance, and more than 60% were intellectually disengaged, engagement meaning a serious intellectual or emotional investment in learning. Another one of their studies shows, and this one's even more frightening, when you're in grade five, your intellectual engagement level's at 82%. By the time you get to grade 11, it's 41%. It's fallen off by half. Mm -hmm. What do you infer from all of those numbers? Well, the first thing is, one thing we learned while we were here is that those um, numbers are very consistent with what they're finding in the United States. So we're not, Canada's not unique in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question that comes to mind is, is that new or has it always been that way? And we're just starting to do the assessments. But I think the uh, presenter yesterday was saying, we should be looking at those engagement levels going up, not down anyways. So I think, I think that's, that should be a, uh, a real rallying cry. That's, that's a clarion call for action. If you have, and I, I know that in high school levels, you have less than 50% reporting. These are, these are students reporting on their own intellectual engagement. Hmm. Students themselves are saying, uh, less than 50% of them are feeling intellectually engaged in their own learning. So it's, um, it's what's bringing people like us here to talk about how do we change the system, how do we change the schools, what's the role of the teachers, what's the role of the system. We are, we are going to hear from the experts more tonight, but first we actually do want to hear from students. So we've got some clips here. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll tape and play these clips. Almost failed grade 11 math. <laughs> Whether it was my work habits or not, I. I honestly can't recall. I don't remember learning anything. I don't remember, you know, working hard on math. Um, it was probably me just not putting enough effort. The thing with me is that I don't do good in school because it's more like if I have no interest in it, I don't really like to spend my time on it. So I do just enough to get past, basically. That's kind of how I am as a student. <laughs> I found uh, you had very little choice in the matter in terms of um, what you would study and uh, what you would be delving into. They kind of lined up um, a number of courses for you and said you are going to take this, this, this and this. Uh, if they're not relevant, if they don't uh, pertain to your interests, that doesn't matter to us. Um, this is what you're doing. Graham, I've only just met you, but if I had known you when you were 15 years old and I'd asked you, 
What do you think of school? What would you have told me? Um, no, we're on live television, so that would be difficult. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a great experience. I mean, I think I was probably, without fluffing myself, uh, intellectually disengaged. I mean, I was a very intense young man. Um, you know, I used to jump on trains and go into London and shoplift books. We had no internet, you know, because I had a deep interest in things that weren't being met by the school. I mean, the, the education system that I was in, uh, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's quite broad and shallow. It, it didn't allow you to go into depth. So if you became, if I, I was very into science, so I specifically wanted to go delve into a particular subject at depth. The education system didn't allow me. It was like, let's get you through this, and then the bell goes one hour, boom, into the next thing. So it were you therefore a disengaged student because of that? Uh, yes, I mean, I was ultimately expelled. Uh, at 15. And, That's and, and, pretty disengaged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was, okay. So, so that, was, that, that, that was a form of disengagement. I mean, it didn't slow me down. Um, you know, I maintained my own education, and I think in many ways I homeschooled myself. I was a sort of self-directed uh, autodidact, to use a sort of technical, technical term, and I've continued to do that all of my life. Um, you know, for me, and I think in general, the education system, because you know, it's a complex system, we have to automate it as much as we possibly can to get the cost efficiencies and so on. And so you know, we have this thing which we call normal. Um, and anything outside that, you know, because it's a spectrum, it, it, is a, you know, you, you're, you're outside of that, you're an outlier. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that most of those outliers end up being the big entrepreneurs, you know, your Mark Zuckerberg, your Richard Branson's, and all that kind of stuff. But normality, the sort of compliance fits in the middle. I found myself out of that, and I think that when we took, look at the term about disengaged students, we tend to think of disruptive pupils mm -hmm. or, or those from uh, trouble or families in trouble, those kind of things, but there's also a whole uh, other group as well, and I think that the, the systems don't cater for such a broad range. It really caters for that, and if you're not in that, you know, if you get, you know, today, in the UK at least, um, if you are one of you know, the disruptive students, there might be lots of reasons why you're disruptive, and you that system doesn't work for you, the answer is we put you in a pupil referral unit, which the answer is basically that system didn't work, so we're gonna give you the same system, just tougher, and then we wonder why nothing changes. So I think there's this, this problem, is, is the capacity within the existing system, which as you said was designed in the, in the 19th and 20th century, to cater, and I think as, as, as John was saying on, on the end there, you know, young people today, just because you're not in school doesn't mean you're not learning. I mean, you know, I think young people, old people, we love to learn. It's just we're not particularly interested necessarily in what's being presented within that system. One of the new expressions we have learned this week here at the Perimeter Institute is something called a NEET, N-E-E-T, not in an employment, excuse me, not in employment, education, or training. In other words, way too much time on their hands to do nothing. And we want to share some of the numbers here about how we stack up with the rest of the world. The share of young people who are not in employment, in education, or training in Canada is 10.5%. In the United States, way more, 14.8%. In Great Britain, north of 13%. France, 12%. Switzerland, almost 7%. Finland, 8.6%. Turkey, over 30%. Uh, Graham, to what extent do you want to hold schools responsible for these NEETs, as they're called? Um, I don't think, we, I, I think it, that's a, a sort of simplistic argument. I mean, it's, 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 and we, society tends to do this. I mean, after we had the London riots, which I'm sure you, you were, were covered here, you know, there was a sort of knee-jerk reaction. First of all, we blame parents, uh, then we blame teachers and blame schools. Um, and, you know, what we didn't blame was society. And I think that the, it's a societal issue here. Um, yes, you could say that the young people that came out of here uh, had become disengaged and disenfranchised. Um, the lack of relevance to them. I mean, we have a system, and a lot of it, I mean, this has been overplayed as an argument, but just for the simplicity of the, of the discussion here, mm. you know, the idea that we have an education system, which is, and my one, the one that I went to, is fundamentally, look, you're either going to go and work in the factory, or you're going to, you know, if, if you're bright, you go and get a job in a bank and you can become, if you're lucky, you know, a cashier, and then you become a bank manager and so on. And, well, I wanted to be an astronaut, and I was laughed out of, uh, out, out of the charism. So I became disenfranchised from that whole process. And I think that, to some extent, uh, some of that is happening. I mean, I can't explain the whole... I mean, you're looking at an awful lot of people, lots of different reasons. 
I mean, the other th issue that we have within education systems is we don't practice enough early intervention. So there are children at, at various parts, in, at various points in their education who have a problem. It could be a family member has died. It could be a family member has lost their job. It could be an, any number of problems, and it affects people of all social and cultural groups. Sure. This is not a working class or a, a middle class problem. Obviously, mm -hmm. I refer to that because I'm British. But it, it's not necessarily about that. We don't necessarily, for example, have counsellors that can, can find those problems early on, find those challenges, find a safe place. And let's not forget, school for many children is a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, you know, when we start thinking about blame, you know, we have to remember it's a sanctuary for those kids. So I think it's much more complex than saying it's a school. Schools, I think, have to change. I think they have to change simply because the world has changed and the challenges that we face are significantly different. Well, we know that one of the things that creates great students are great teachers. And again, we want to hear from students talking about teachers. Roll tape, please. Half of the teachers that did not care and they were boring, they were uninterested in what they were teaching and they did not care if you took in the information and did your homework or whatever. Like it was their job, they were doing it and they weren't gonna exceed it. The teachers in Ontario, I would say they were, um, they were somewhat disengaged, yes, and that led to the students being disengaged as well. Um, from what I can tell, uh, teachers get bounced around quite a bit within the Ontario school system. So if somebody has a degree in, let's say, English literature, they might be forced into teaching science, even though they know almost nothing about it. And that's just awful. That doesn't lead to a good experience for the teachers or the students. It leads to everyone struggling a little bit. But then you had a handful of other teachers that they would go the extra mile to bring in a specific movie or to change up a textbook reading to make it more interesting. And you could tell if they were doing this for science or art, they actually liked it. So I think that makes a big difference. And it's also very engaging when you have a teacher that you see they really like something. And if you don't really like it, you kind of look like, well, if they see something in it that they like, maybe I should give it a shot at least to get a good mark. OK, let's continue the conversation with Kaisa. And one of the things that we constantly hear is that you Finns are the best at this in the world. Finland is the education miracle. And one of the reasons we're told that the Finnish school system is so good is because you've got the best teachers in the world. Is that really true? Well, maybe it's part of the truth that we, um, that teaching is a very um, desired profession in Finland. So we get to pick and choose the students who get into the programs in the departments of teacher education. So that, that way we like to think that we get to really have the best students. And do you think well-educated, well-engaged teachers are part of Finland's secrets to keeping students engaged? We saw the numbers earlier. Your numbers are half of what, the less than half of what they are in the United States. Well, yeah, we like to think so. Like our teachers must have a master's degree, and they also um, we we teach them to be researchers in their work, and so then they will have more skills and different methods to use in their teaching for the in children in the schools as well. My hunch is there's a lot of people in North America who if you said, what does your kid want to do when he grows up or she grows up? And if the answer is go into teaching, some people would say, hmm, that's not the case in Finland? It's seen as a desirable thing to do? Yes, it is seen as a desirable thing to do. That um, I think in, uh, in University of Helsinki, this year only 7% of the applicants got into the class teacher program. So, uh, <laughs> so there are a lot, of, a lot of people out there who would like to become teachers. Is the teachers union very powerful in Finland? Um, it is, yes, or it is there to support the teachers. Is that a good thing? I think it is a good thing. How does yes. it contribute to a better education system? Well, they oversee the rights for the teachers and, uh, and to make sure that the teachers' um, voice is being heard in the society. And Are teachers well paid in Finland? Well, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of times that the teachers themselves would say that no, they're not paid enough. But um, yeah, maybe I'm not the right judge of that. <laughs> but <laughs> then they do have long holidays and they have shorter days than in many other places in the, in the world in schools. So it must be quite competitive. One of the things I've also heard frequently uh, when you ask students, who from the beginning of their educational experience to the end have exposure to hundreds and hundreds of teachers, potentially. Uh, and if they're asked, who really made a difference in your life, oftentimes they can only come up with one or two or three names. Is that the case also in Finland, do you think? Um, 
Well, <laughs> I'm sure that it could be that many times when we think back to our childhood and maybe we only had one or two teachers in our elementary schools. But, um, but yeah, maybe it is only one or two teachers that have made a big difference. But I think even if there is one teacher who uh, we can remember as making a big difference in our lives, even that is sometimes enough. One is enough in this case. Uh, sometimes it can be. If it's somebody who, that you know that there was a teacher who really believed in you and made you believe in yourself, that you can really achieve what you want to achieve in life. Great. Susan, let me continue with you. All of what we're talking about tonight, is this a first world problem or do you see it in the developing world as well? Um, I think it is a first world, I mean, if you're talking about disengagement, mm -hmm. then I think it cuts across the board because the issue of whether a child is learning in class, in school, is something that we are all discussing today, and that means that we are all concerned. Um, in the case of Uganda, because we have a one system, you know, one fits all uh, system, policy, curricula, you know, we are beginning to understand that many children aren't learning in class because, you know, a ratio of one teacher to about 60 students and, you know, the talk and chalk, you know, kind of teaching you know, is being questioned whether, you know, it actually facilitates learning. You find that the, the high achievers, the good students actually will learn. However, the average child and the slow learners are left behind. And the teacher, because they have to complete a, a syllabus, you know, they move on. And oftentimes, the average child, the slow learner is actually caned or something like that for not passing an exam. So it's a problem. Did I hear right that you have classes, the average class size is 60 to 1? Yes. The average? Yes. How much teaching can you do in a class of 60 kids? Well, that's the question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> how do you, I can't imagine how you keep 60, how one teacher keeps 60 students engaged. I don't know how you would do that. Can you do that? I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I'm not a teacher, but um, I think as I was growing up, the classes were smaller. And I think the government of Uganda is thinking about making classes smaller. Although I've heard educationalists you know, say that uh, the class size doesn't really matter, what matters is the teacher. So maybe teachers amongst us will answer that you know, on our behalf. Okay. Uh, access to schools is not a problem we think we have in the so-called first world. Anybody in the province of Ontario who wants to go to school, who's a citizen, can go to school or even not a citizen, obviously, uh, landed immigrants as well, etc. cetera. Uh, how big an issue is that where you're from, just getting access to the school? Access to school is a big problem. You may talk about access to primary school and the introduction of the universal primary education, which you know, um, is part of an MDG goal. Um, that has enabled a number of students, actually, or pupils, go to school. However, they go to school at the primary level and then cannot transit to the secondary level. I think secondary level education for now is at about 24%. So if you ask yourself, where are the other students or young people in society, what are they doing? Uh, it's a question that really needs to be you know, um, looked into um, because many, of, many students come to school or cannot access school because it's far it's not uh, available within their vicinity. They can't meet the costs. And even if we are talking about universal secondary education, you know, there are a lot of hidden costs that are requested or asked for by the schools. Mm. So that kind of leaves out a number of students because you know, their circumstances are a bit difficult. So access is a problem. We saw some numbers yesterday, I think, in one of the presentations that said there will be 134 million kids born in the world this year and half of them aren't going to finish high school, and most of them are in African and Asian countries. Mm -hmm. As you look forward, I mean, what, what does that portend if that trend continues? It's sad. It's sad, because for me, I think, to, in today's world, there is nothing as good as education, and there is nothing that anyone can offer you, be it your parent or, you know, even God, maybe, you know, that is better than education because education gives you all the opportunities that you would be able to receive or attain in this world. So children left out of education are, 
you know, will suffer. There is a reason why we go to school. There is a reason why we need to learn. So if you don't learn in whatever circumstance, then there is, uh, I think, um, a challenge for you and a big one at that. Gotcha. Uh, we've been playing videos throughout the course of our program this evening, and we want to let everybody know that these videos that you see during our program and longer form versions as well are all on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash the agenda. Go there, see these videos in their entirety, and listen to the students talk about these experiences in their own voices. It's really quite moving to watch this. We're going to play another one right now on the classes that we want. Roll tape, please. Our class was always more fun. You know, you could talk with your friends while working. Um, you know, you could go on computers, look for inspirational things, you know, listen to music. You were a lot more inspired in that class, and the teachers were really supportive of that. High school should be like a drama class. They should like reenact the scenes, but instead they like just go straight forward and like they go strict ways instead of going fun ways because more people learn easier if you're happy and if you're and it's funner instead of like angry and strict. Angry and strict. Those are the words we've heard a lot this week. Uh, let me just remind everybody as well, since we're about halfway through the program, that we are here at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario. We're here for the whole week during a, a series of programs as part of our Learning 2030 series, which we've been doing on TVO for the last year or so. If you haven't been able to come down here to the PI and join us in person, you can still be part of tonight's discussion. We're live streaming and live chatting right now at tvo.org slash learning2030. Use the hashtag Learning2030 or the hashtag EQX13 and join our conversation. And Zainab, you've been so patient, now it's your turn. Here we go. You try, as a part of what you do, to reach out to disengaged youth, and how much of their feelings of dis disengagement stem from the last couple of words that we heard from that last student. They see school as a place that is angry and strict. Absolutely. I think that they see school as a place that is angry and strict because that, that is how those school systems are responding to students who do not uh, conform to the very singular way that we, that we teach and that we expect students to learn. So this in turn frustrates students and that frustrates teachers who may not be necessarily well equipped to, to cater to those students uh, you know, who, who may learn differently, who learn better standing up, who learn better moving around. It's a lot to ask for in a class of you know, 20, 25, 30, uh, whatever it may be. If you're having, you know, d does that mean that you divide the classroom into a number of small groups to cater to everybody's interest? Maybe, maybe that's not what's most appropriate. But the point is that they don't feel like their needs are being met uh, in the classroom. And uh, I, I think it's only natural that that atmosphere of frustration and anger would, would come out of that. You know, if you just think, common sense tells you that to take, let's say, for example, 20 boys mm -hmm. who are the ages of 10 or 11 and put them in very small desks and tell them to sit there and not move for 40 minutes and just write down what you hear, I mean, on the face of it, that sounds like a failure. Why do we still do that? You know, I don't know why we still do that, but I think there is a very deep fear of failure in trying something new. Uh, so, you know, it's, maybe it's a hard sell to the parents that we're gonna, we're gonna let these young boys, uh, you know, do whatever they want or, or create their own learning opportunities. But I don't think it's until we actually do that that we recognize the potential that these students have to, um, to absorb information when they are engaged. They, they don't, they're not anti-learning. Um, but the system, I think, has, has discouraged learning um, and has disempowered those, those young people uh, at any age. We see it, I mean, the, the summit is talking about high school students, but I think it starts, it starts even earlier when you take the agency away from the student and say, now you are on the receiving end of this, of this education that I'm going to now impart to you, um, and you have no say about the way in which I do that or, or what it is that I tell you. Uh, if we were going to compare, and again, picking up on this angry and strict, if we were going to compare the attitude of immigrant kids versus kids who, you know, whose parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have been here for generations, mm -hmm. the same, different, how? 
Yeah, I think that um, it, it's very, very difficult to, to integrate. Uh, I've, I've worked with newcomer immigrants and refugees as well, um, and, and looking at issues of disengagement in those populations, and they want to be engaged so desperately. But there are such simple things, like a language barrier, which you know anybody might assume, that prevents them from, uh, from you know, using, using the right resources, from, from feeling like they are a part of their school as a community. Much of, much of uh, what I have found through my work is that, um, is that once you connect those students to their school and their local communities, and and to begin to see them as community systems, they're far more um, interested in in participating in in uh, in making a difference. And you know, somebody who is a who's a recent immigrant has a lot to offer, has a very uh, unique perspective, and can enrich can enrich their peers. But if we don't give them that opportunity, or if we don't support them with the, in the unique ways that they need support, then we we're actually at a loss, and we're disadvantaged for excluding those voices. Let me get speaking of those voices, all of your voices involved in. The the program at this point now, and I want to do it by asking a question that I think many people will think is odd. Are our children in class too much? There are not many parents who would say yes, but let's put some numbers up here and uh, then we'll discuss. Numbers of hours students spend in the classroom in a variety of countries. Control room, let's bring these up. In Finland, students on average spend a little north of 1,400 hours in class. But in Denmark, it's north of 1,600. In England, it's north of 1,700. In Canada, it's north of 1,800. And we're well above the OECD average, which is almost 1,700. Do, are there too many classroom hours for our students? Is that part of why students are disengaged? John. Great question. Uh, I think the one thing we have to differentiate is between quantity versus quality. And if you actually have a quality education system that's offering what the students need and engages them and inspires them and, and cares for them, then I, I think the difference between those numbers becomes less meaningful. Uh, if you have a system that is uh, not providing what uh, <coughs> the kind of learning that the kids need and deserve, then it's probably time to get them out of that system as early as possible <laughs> and, and uh, try to engage the community more and, and even parents more in the learning experiences that they're exposed to. Graham, I'm going to get you to follow up because I see British kids, where you're from, have 300 fewer hours in the class than the Finns, who are the best in the world at this. Explain. Yeah, I, I'm not sure there's a correlation. I mean, it's what you're, I mean, as John says, it's what you're doing in those hours. I mean, I think that, you know, it's back to the industrial model. I mean, we, we tend in a lot of schools in, in, in secondary education, you know, the bell rings at a certain specific time, maybe an hour, and then suddenly you just switch mode and you go to the next thing and you have to reset yourself. Now, if that's how you lived your working day, would you accept that? Most of the adults in this room would not accept that, and yet we put kids through that. And it's, well, to accept, what do we want? Do we want the school to be daycare? Is that the idea? Is that why we put them in there for such a long time? And if it is daycare, let's be honest about it and make that more an interesting uh, experience. And perhaps, for example, let's, let's now um, let's, let's expand the, the, the timetable. So rather than having one hour lessons, maybe as one academy in the UK, Easter Academy, um, they now have, each pupil in the secondary education has two uh, three-hour classes per day. And that gives the, the, it doesn't mean that the teacher has to lesson plan for that whole three hours, but it gives the oxygen for reflection, for um, self-learning, self-organizing learning groups, where the lesson is set, the, the dialogue occurs with the teacher, and then um, the, the pupils are allowed to then work within groups to solve problems and then come back and reflect. So I think that it's, it's not necessarily, I mean, of course it comes to a point where too, like if you work too many hours a week, it's, it's not healthy. But I think in the, in the hours you're showing there, I think it's about what happens in that time that enables the engagement and the, the richness of, of the lesson. I think if we're using those hours and just sticking to the one hour here, one hour there, one hour there, then it's going to fail. You're going to become disengaged. Okay, having said that, uh, Kaiser, as we look at the numbers here, Finnish children spend almost 400 fewer hours on average in the class each year than Canadian kids. And yet your scores are better, your outcomes are better, your system has a better reputation around the world. Is there something here? 
Well, I think I agree with these gentlemen here that it's more about the quality than the quantity. That's what I would like to think, at least. Um, because I've also heard that in Finland we do, we do uh, or we give less homework to our students to do at home after the, after the school hours. You give I, less homework? That's what I, well, yes. No wonder children like uh, school there more than they like it here. Okay. <laughs> but but yet, I, I think that we're doing a lot of things right in Finland, but I'm sure that we have too many children there who are also disengaged. That hmm. there, we could be improving our quality of education and the, improving the quality of the lessons so that they would be more actively involved in... Um, in steering their own education and being just actively being involved in project and projects and things that they're actually um, working on and not just definitely not listening to the teacher speak in front of the class. In which case, let's spend what time we have left on this program, almost 20 minutes, talking about some solutions. How do we arrest this appalling trend of disengagement from m millions of students who won't have a chance succeeding in 2030 if they don't stay in school, stay engaged, get more education, et cetera. Zainab, do you want to help start us off on this discussion here? How can we re-engage? Sure. I, I don't think that if students, first of all, I just want to, want to question that initial assumption that if students step outside of the school system, they will not be well equipped uh, in the future. So for me, what a, what a well-equipped student, what a good student is, you know, coming out of high school or, or uh, you know, at that age in, in 2030, as the summit focuses on, is somebody who's able to solve complex global problems, so has the skills to do that. And we've been talking a lot about that over the past few okay. days. Would you grant that for 95% of kids, that's going to mean staying in school all the way to the end? Uh, it depends on what kinds of schools they're in, because, because again, and, and I've met you know, a number of people over the past few years that if, if, if they had stayed in school, that spark that they had within them would have been absolutely completely extinguished. You know, we don't know how many people uh, or, or how many solutions we're missing out on because we force students to stay in school and, and to conform and... Okay, I won't push it then. I yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, but I do see that um, at, at the same time that there can be a solution that comes from within a restructuring of the school system, a restructuring of priorities within the school system. Okay. For example, you want to restructure a school system to re-engage students yeah. better. How? Tell me one thing you'd do. So I think uh, what one thing that you could do is to give students more opportunity to um, perhaps enter a state of flow. So when they re recognize that they're you know, passionate about something, to, to have all of the resources um, available for them to continue down that path and spend five hours of the school day on one you know, single science experiment or, so or writing no arbitrary a story. Math for an hour, science for an hour, English for an hour. Yeah, you, you Let know, them why go. not? I, I think it's important that we develop well-rounded students who are able, you know, who are able to communicate and who are who are able to engage in in civic affairs. But at the same time, if there's something that interests you, well, time's up. You got to go. Like that doesn't that doesn't sounds counterintuitive to me. Right, Susan, do you want to add to the list? Tell me one thing we can do to re-engage students more. I think if I'm talking about our situation then I would deal with the teacher because I know that we won't change the system today. And even if we are changing it tomorrow, it will take a while. And the support systems that you know, enable that and facilitate learning need to be worked on. And I think the teacher will have to be supported to understand the context and you know, appreciate the changing world. Graham. I think relevance. I think that there's a, I think that young people need to have a, a sense of relevance uh, in what they're doing within the education environment. And, and a lot of what we teach is siloed, you know, like, like we were saying, you know, math, English, science. But that's not the real world. Life I doesn't mean, work that way. I, exactly. I mean, there's a huge emphasis on STEM at the moment. But, the, you know, Just his, his, uh, oh, sorry, science, technology, engineering and math. Right. Um, now, newsflash, every country is doing that. There's going to be a kid the other side of the world that will do the same job uh, with STEM qualifications for 20% of that salary. So unless we have some creativity in there, unless we're applying those things to something real. And so what I'm suggesting is perhaps then we need to look at uh, the curriculum, look at how we teach, and rather than having these as abstract siloed subjects, perhaps we look at problem solving, where the, as, a, as a consequence of solving a problem within a lesson, you're working collaboratively, you have that as a sort of contextual hub for sort of rich, deep learning where right, we need mathematics here, we need some science here, we need some creative thinking here, we need some collaboration here, we need to go online here. And then suddenly you're creating something which is then embedded in you because you've made something, rather than just dealing with an abstract equation. Because our curriculum from the 19th and 20th century is fact-based. You know, we have to remember these facts and then regurgitate them at a given time. But facts are free now. They're on the end of your smartphone. 
You know, there's, you know why set an examination, which, which is a, a question that you could find in three seconds? Mm. You know, why don't we change the assessment system so that we could, for example, it, 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 take our iPads or our smartphones in the examination room to see how we collaborate? Because clearly, you know, the 21st century has happened. So why aren't we using 21st century technologies within the examination room to see how agile our learners are? So I think relevance and changing assessment and, 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 and changing the curriculum would be the things that I would, I would do. John, one of the things we've heard over and over throughout this whole past year of doing our Learning 2030 series is that we have a model that was established during agrarian times. We've talked about it already today. Everybody's got the summer off so they can go till the fields. We don't live in that kind of, 97% of people don't live in that kind of a world anymore. So here's the question. If you tried to redesign the school system to sit all year long, or if you acknowledge that 16 or 17 year old teenage boys just can't get up and be, have their all, you know, cylinders firing at 8.30 in the morning at school, that maybe the better hours for them would be noon to eight, how much pushback would there be from the education establishment to implementing ideas like those? From the education establishment, I think it would be less than you would think. Uh, from the Canadian public, I think it would be far greater than you would think. Is that the stumbling block right now? I, I think, and I'm going to take the opportunity to, to speak to Canadians at the, the program, I think we have to recognize, they have to recognize that um, we do have to see change and major change on an urgent basis. And the Canadian education system uh, rightfully has a great uh, reputation. We've scored well on international tests and everything else. So there's a complacency that builds in. So all of the innovation and all of the uh, changes that we really need to create a new 21st century model are only going to go forward in a timely fashion if Canadians breathe life into it. So they have to understand that there's a need for change. Uh, and that's going to benefit students. It's going to benefit the country. But if they don't step up and breathe life into it and support the changes, then it's going to be a hard uh, road for the rest of the education system to make things happen. Well, let me just state the obvious here. We get about four months of good weather in this country every year. And two months of those are July and August when people, if they have cottages, want to be away at cottage or kids want to be away at overnight camp or whatever it is they want to do. They don't want to be in schoolrooms during July and August. How do you convince Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Canada that the way it's been for 150 years should not be the way it goes forward? I, for one, wouldn't, because I, I, I think it's not about changing the system to run uh, uh, for a full year. I think there's opportunities that you can provide uh, uh, students uh, in the summer months. But again, I don't think it's a quantity thing. I think it's a quality thing. And I think the first step is to change what we're doing in those uh, seven, eight, nine months before we start uh, uh, tinkering around with uh, people's summer vacations. And there, there again, is a bit of a challenge in the sense that if you try to bring about big change like that, you are going to get into some resistance. So I'm a big believer in evolution versus revolution, but it's got to be on an urgent basis. Kaisa, give us some ideas on how we can re-engage those students who are disengaged today. Well, I think when Finn and we talk about phenomenon-based learning, so there would be a theme or a topic that would be uh, that the that the students would be learning, and it wouldn't be just only related to mathematics or biology or geography, but it would be something that maybe many teachers would be um, involved in together, because nothing in life is only about mathematics or biology, just like Graham mentioned earlier. So we should be learning um, things in bigger entities so that we would actually understand what they mean in, in real life and that they would be, well, related to actual life. You know, there are probably going to be people watching us tonight who will conclude, I'm sure you would all say wrongly, that there are quote unquote lazy or just disinterested students who have been with us since the beginning of education and they always will be and all of the fancy ideas that we want to throw on the table here you know, will work with some, but the fact is there are always going to be quote unquote laggards with us. Would they be wrong to conclude that? Uh, well, that was something that I t uh, thought, thought of earlier, that when we were talking about a good student, that what is a good student? I don't think a good student is necessarily one who's achieving the best or getting the best numbers. 
that if we, um, because a, a student or a child who's not learning quite as well might still be a good student, if they're, as long as they're doing their best. So that's something that we sort of need to rethink as well and give everyone an, an opportunity. And we have different kinds of learners in the classroom. Like for example, my um, ninth grade boy, he doesn't like to sit still throughout the 45 minute lessons. So I think that's something that teachers should be taking into account and let them wander around and go maybe outside of the classroom and do different things. Because I think for anybody, it should be difficult to sit still for too long. We don't have a system that allows for that today, right, Graham? If, we, if, if somebody can't sit still for 45 minutes, we throw a piece of chalk at them and tell them to go sit in the hallway or go to the principal's office or something like that, right? Well, That's a great uh, way to engage a student. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, just to use a personal example, my, uh, my now eight-year-old daughter, when she was six, I went to the, the year one sort of teacher's meeting type thing, and glowing report about my daughter's behavior, but she said, well, actually, the only one problem is that she won't sit still on the mat. I just said, well, perhaps she's bored. Didn't go down too well. <laughs> um, in the evening, she was in a gymnastics class. She'd been doing it for a little while, but you have to be six years old before you can be recruited into the London squad. And so she was there doing her thing. There's a, uh, one, of the, one of the coaches, one of the sort of spotters, came up to us at the end of her gymnastics class and said, would you allow her to join the London squad? She now does 15 hours of gymnastics training uh, and is a gold medalist huh. for London at eight years old. Fair the right. fact was that she wasn't bored. She was a gymnast. Uh, <laughs> and they were trying to force her to stay still. And I think we have to be cognizant of each individual child. And, and the point you're making about, you know, there's always going to be lag guards and so on. I don't believe that kids are born lazy or born without the desire. I think things happen to them in the process. And I think we need to be mindful of what's happening. And, and you know, we either pay now or we pay later. Hmm. You know, we either deal with the problem now or we deal with it later. Much better to do it at an early stage. And I think that's, that's what we're talking about here. What percentage of kids, though, would be like your daughter who is just waiting for either the right teacher or the right principal or the right somebody to come along and unlock their inner genius, which in a normal system, just isn't going to come out. I think that that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think that you know, this is where we look at the, the sort of teaching profession, the art of teaching. And we've, I think as a society, we begin to forget that teaching is a profession, it is an art. It, you know, it, it's not an assembly worker. And I think that, that to some extent, we're beginning to do that. We have done that in some education systems where the school has become sort of a factory and the, the children are the raw material and the, and the teaching has been, has been de-skilled, not because of teachers, but because of, uh, of what policy makers are imposing upon them to sort of turn the handle and there's a quality control assessment at the end to make sure it's right. And that's fine if you're building cars or spoons, but we're, we, what, we look, what we need, what all of our nations need, are creative, innovative thinkers. And that doesn't produce those. And so absolutely, we need those teachers who can spot that and be aware of that. Those teachers do exist. You know, we need more of them, we need to embrace them, and we need to encourage that sort of spotting, effectively like the scout that spotted my daughter's hmm. ability at gymnastics. I was going to follow up with Zena. What do you, do you think we have enough teachers in our system right now, let's say in the province of Ontario, who are themselves engaged enough on the job to recognize that spirit and let it, let it come out? They have the... They have the um, individual desire to see that come out. Mm -hmm. I think we have many teachers who care, many, enough? many teachers who care. I don't know if we have enough um, and, and whether, I mean, I mean, people, you know, experience a number of different teachers over their education, perhaps, but, but the point is that the teachers who do care may not feel well, um, well equipped to, to facilitate that passion development in those, in those young children. So they care and they want to, to encourage those students, but I don't think that we are teaching teachers how to do that effectively. We have to teach teachers better. I think so. So that they can teach the students better. Yeah, hmm. instead of teaching teachers simply, you know, to, to relate content in three different ways, let's teach them to, you know, build uh, citizenship in, in their students. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let's try this one just uh, finally here in our last few minutes. Um, not that long ago, schools and teachers decided whether it was the students who lived up to their expectations. Today, we seem to be in a different world where students, and we've seen this in the videos, it's the students who sit in judgment of the teachers and the principals and the education system to see whether they are meeting the students' needs. John, start us off. Is that the way it should be? 
I think it's uh, I think it's absolutely a sign of the times in terms of where we need to go in the sense that student voice in uh, the governance of education in identifying uh, and being able to follow their own passions and being able to identify what they're interested in and working with teachers. And so the, the model where it used to be the teacher at the front dispensing knowledge to the student and very articulate students there saying, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, the, if the teacher didn't care or, or wasn't passionate, then I, I'm not passionate. This has got a, the new model would be one more of a collaborative approach. Uh, between students and teachers, and I agree 100%. That's a new role for teachers. There has to be some training there, and it's a new role for students as well. And so there needs to be uh, uh, some nurturing of that. But, but if, if that's the, the way it is, teachers had better get used to the new normal, right? Yes, and and we need to support them in that regard. Uh, mm -hmm. That's absolutely. We have great teachers. I think some of them are just dis, as disenfranchised as the students mm -hmm. within the current model. Um, and the other thing that Canadians have to understand, there are great examples of this happening in pockets across the country. So it's not like we don't know what works. The problem is it's not systemic and it's not something that is necessarily recognized in uh, policy across the country. Susan, is that the way it is in your experience in Uganda where the students now, in some respects, sit in judgment of the teachers and the principals and the system? Yes, they may sit in judgment, however, not to the extent that is happening here mm -hmm. because of the, you know, we have a system of education and it's not just changing as fast as, you know, it is here. So while the student may judge um, the teachers, it's from the, you know, from behind. It's, it's rare that, you know, a student will come out rightly and say the teacher is doing this because, you know, it's not acceptable. The culture doesn't allow it, doesn't permit it. Um, a child who does that will say, you know, be attributed to be mean or unruly or, you know, something like that. So there is a trial of, you know, involving and engaging students in governance and in, you know, school management and trying to, ins to see that um, the stakeholders in education, that is the student, the teachers or, you know, school leadership and the parents work together in order to, you know, achieve unity, you know, of purpose in the school setting. Kaisa, is it that way in Finland where the students now sit in judgment of the administrators and the, stu and the uh, and et cetera? Yeah, well, it is, it's definitely not only the students, but also parents want to be very involved mm -hmm. in their schools, in their children's education. And so there needs to be um, mutual and, you know, beneficial interaction between the teachers and the students and the children. Hmm. Or the student, yeah. Graham, let me give you the last word on that. Is that how it works in the UK? Uh, I think we're giving teachers too much of a hard time, too much of the time. I mean, we, it, it, I mean, yes, I think that there should be the opportunity for for students to uh, have feedback into their teachers. But we know, I think that the number of checks and balances, you know, the the unexpected <laughs> attendance from the state to make sure you're doing your job, the league tables and everything else, these work against the teacher. They make the teacher risk averse. It's very difficult to innovate if you're going to be severely penalized, penalized for, for, for some kind of failure. Innovation is messy. You know, if you want our teachers to innovate, you know, we need to get, cut them some slack. I think there's, there's, too, many, there's too many of these constant uh, focusing and blaming and trying to catch them doing things wrong when we should be catching them doing things right. That's a great place to leave it tonight. I want to thank all five of you for coming in and helping us out with our broadcast this evening from left to right on your screens. Uh, where are we here? There's Graham Brown Martin, the founder of Education Design Labs from London, UK, and beside her, Z excuse me, beside him, Zainab Ramahi, the co president of Knowledge Integration Student Society at the University of Waterloo, followed by Susan Opok, managing director promoting equality in African schools from Uganda. Beside her, Kaiza Kwopla, from PhD, the PhD student rather, from the Department of Teacher Education at the University of Helsinki. And finally, John Kershaw, the co-founder, 21st Century Learning Associates, the former deputy minister in New Brunswick's Department of Education. Thank you very much, everybody, for being with us this evening. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.